Uh, thank you very much, Tan Sri. And a very good afternoon. The problem with being the last speaker, of course, is that everything I wanted to say has been said by the previous speakers. Anyway, I shall try to entertain you for the next 15 minutes by uh, sticking to the theme of uh, domestic uh, fault lines in Southeast Asia. I think my colleague has covered Malaysia very well already, and the previous speaker has covered North Asia extremely well. Okay, um, when I talk about Southeast Asia, very often I start off with a map of Southeast Asia. Uh, the reason why I like to do this is to give you an idea of how big the region really is. Uh, part of the problem we have with Southeast Asia is that people who are not from Southeast Asia very often think that it is a small region and that it is a region that is basically, uh, in terms of geographical space, all stuck together when in fact it's not. Uh, the good news is that the world outside view the region as a very dynamic region and it is the home of several of Asia's tiger economies, uh, such as Indonesia, Malaysia, increasingly Vietnam and Thailand. It is of course very well known throughout the world as the base of the Association of Southeast Asian Studies and also the newest country in this region, which is Timor-Leste, with a combined population of uh, just under 700 million people. And of course, strategically, it's of course very, very important. And we saw this a few years ago when Obama made the very strategic move called the US pivot to Southeast Asia. Increasingly, in terms of security issues, we're also becoming very important, and you can see that the premier security dialogue in the region is actually the ARF, ASEAN Regional Forum, where all the major powers come together uh, to speak about security issues. Uh, not least, we also control a major waterway in the region, which is the Straits of Malacca, and of course, uh, in terms of conflict, there's also a conflict in the Spratly Islands, which is the South China Sea. But I do not want to cover the international aspect uh, for, uh, for the simple reason that I really do not have time. So I'll just cover the domestic aspect. I think one of the things, key points that I, I want all of you to take away is that uh, although Southeast Asia may look like a, a region where everything is very similar, in reality, the region is actually very, very different. The sort of similarities that you find in Southeast Asia is actually very superficial. I mean, people like to think that Malaysia and Indonesia are very similar because in some ways our language are similar and our cultures are similar in terms of religion. Uh, in fact, uh, that's not true. If you look at the history of Southeast Asia, you'll find that you know, there are many regime types and countries in this region have very different levels of economic and political development or underdevelopment, depends on where you stand. And of course, countries in this region are at a various stage of democratization. I'll start off by looking at some of the regimes we find in Southeast Asia. And what is interesting is that you find a whole range of different regimes in Southeast Asia. You have absolute monarchy with Brunei Darussalam. Then you have simple uh, single party dominant uh, system. Uh, for example, Malaysia, Singapore, Cambodia, and Timor-Leste. It's very clear that the single party has been dominant since independence. Then you have a military or military back regimes in Myanmar. Then you have communist back regime in countries like Vietnam and Laos. And of course, uh, just recently you have competitive systems such as those found in the Philippines, Thailand, and Indonesia. Now, if you move on to a political index, I think the one that is most widely used and perhaps the most influential is the Freedom House Index. And what is very clear is that you find that there's no country in Southeast Asia that has been classified as a free society. Uh, PR here stands for political rights, and CL stands for civil liberties. Um, the higher the score, the worse it is. Huh? So you can see that uh, Indonesia has actually moved, as you all know, during the Suharto era, uh, Indonesia scored very badly. But what I'm trying to get through to you is that uh, there's no country in Southeast Asia that's actually been classified free. What you have is partially free and not free. And what is very interesting about this figure that was published last year is that uh, out of the 10 countries in Southeast Asia, you get as that 50% that is partly free and the other 50% not free at all. Right, in terms of uh, levels of development, the most widely used index, of course, is the UNDP's HDI, Human Development Index. And if you look at Southeast Asia, again, whole range of countries, it got countries with a very low human development like Myanmar, all the way up to basically first world countries in terms of the index like Singapore and Brunei. And in between you've got high human development countries such as Malaysia and medium human development countries such as the Philippines, Thailand, Cambodia, Timor-Leste, Laos and Indonesia. 
Another very important index that people often use when they assess the country is, of course, Transparency International's uh, Corruption Perception Index. Uh, latest data that has come out was, again, 2013. And if you look at this, this is the reverse, all the better it is. Out of 175 countries, you can see that, you know, more than half of the countries in Southeast Asia are actually at the bottom half. Okay, not a very good record. And in fact, the country with the best record, uh, which is equal to the first world country, is actually Singapore at 86 points, and they rank fifth out of 175, out, out of 175 countries. And the worst country we have in this region has a, a very low score of 20, and they rank 160 out of 175, so right at the bottom, and they have a wide range uh, uh, in between. Okay? So again, the split is 50-50, very similar to the data I show about Freedom House, where 50% is partly free, the other 50% is not free at all. One other interesting index, which is not widely known, but which is widely used by scholars, is actually the Social Hostilities Index. Uh, this is an index that measures basically uh, religious and societal tensions. And uh, what is interesting from the data, the latest data is actually two years old, you'll find it, again, whole range in Southeast Asia. Uh, countries with very high potential for uh, 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 hostilities are countries like Indonesia. Potentially high are countries like Thailand, Vietnam and the Philippines, Modric, Brunei, Laos, Timor-Leste, uh, Malaysia and Cambodia. And of course when this figure came out, a lot of people disagreed with it because they thought that Malaysia should be on the high side. And the country with the lowest score is Singapore. Okay, so Singapore has done very well. So to sum off, I think uh, you can look at, if you, if you were to summarize out what are the key domestic uh, fault lines you have in this region, I think you can group them basically into six core areas. So ethnicity and religion uh, has been mentioned a few times by the first speaker, and you find that this is a major fault line uh, in many countries. Uh, the clear and obvious areas are places like Southern Thailand, the Moro region in the Philippines, and increasingly in places like Kalimantan. And also you have uh, sectarian killings in, in Myanmar as we speak. Then you have the issues related to regionalism, and you find that you, know, you have problems with that again in southern Thailand, in the southern Philippines, and increasingly in places like West Papua. Okay? Then you have links uh, with uh, economic growth and poverty. Uh, this is a key area for scholars to study in terms of fault lines, because every time there's a financial crisis, like what happened in 2000, and, uh, sorry, 1997-1998, it caused major problems in the region. Uh, those of you who know your contemporary history will know that immediately after the financial crisis came about, uh, Suharto uh, fell after 33 years in power. Okay? So this is a major issue. And also, if you look at the figures carefully, uh, despite the strong economic growth that uh, Southeast Asia has experienced in the last 50 years, uh, about 40% of the population in Southeast Asia are actually living below the poverty line, huh? which is defined as less than US $2 a day. Then you have issues about the quality of elections. And here the standard joke I like to give people is that elections in Southeast Asia are always free, but they're never fair. And again, you will find this all over the region. Uh, the index that's widely used, of course, is the Election Integrity Project uh, done by the University of Sydney and uh, uh, Harvard University. And again, uh, many countries in the region, countries like the Philippines and, and, and Malaysia, have done very badly in this index. And of course, the big C, corruption, and I'm sure uh, Malaysians know all about this and the abuse of power. So this part, I don't need to say anything because it's all around us 24-7. <laughs> and of course, the pace of reforms. I think this is a major fault line in this region because uh, part of the problem we have in this region is that we have a very young population. If you look at the demography of this region, you'll be quite amazed that you know, the bulk of the population, the overwhelming majority is actually uh, under 50 years old. And you know, with the increasing growth in the middle class, especially in countries like Vietnam and Indonesia, uh, there's more calls for participation in the political making process. And this, of course, will lead to tensions, especially the pace of reforms. People want reforms and they want it now. And if they don't get it, they go to social media, complain about it. And as you know, right, uh, in Malaysia, the two largest demonstrations happened after the invention of Facebook and Twitter. So, uh, what does this all mean? What it means is that there's no solutions because in every case they reflect deep fault lines that have existed for many, many years and many, many generations. A lot of it existed during the colonial times. After independence, they just carried through. Some of them were managed, some of them were mismanaged. 
But I think the important point or takeaway point I'd like all of you to remember is that many of these issues cannot be resolved. They can only be managed. And that the pace of reforms now is more urgent due to the advent of the social media and the internet. So what we need is a new type of leadership and better public policies. And in other words, there's plenty of work for JCI to do in the coming years. Thank you very much.